Good morning. Um, so this is a song that Elsie had asked us to sing a while back. And um, Elsie, there she is back there. So um, there are two things about this song. It's One is about losing, losing a loved one. But the most important thing is that the very breath we breathe comes from Jesus. And that as believers, um, we will see Jesus and spend more time with him. So uh, that's all I need to say. A little kiss, a little coffee, a little moment to pray. Our Sunday mornings always started that way. Make up in the mirror, humming a gospel song. When I came down the stairs, I knew that something was wrong. He was lying on the floor, he was in a better place, and I could tell for sure by that sweet look on his face, he saw Jesus, he saw Jesus, and he took his breath away, he was a man. Who never wanted to leave his house, but he went on that day. He saw the heavens open, saw the fathers open arms. And when you feel that kind of love, how can you stay when you see Jesus? He saw Jesus and he took his breath away. No, I didn't lose him. I know right where he is. Cause he was never really mine. No, he, he was always his. And though I miss his kisses, I can't feel that empty space. It helps when I remember that sweet look on his face. And he saw Jesus, he saw Jesus, and he took his breath away. He was a man who never wanted to leave his house, but he went on that day he saw the heavens open saw the father's open arms and when, when you feel, feel that kind of love how can you stay when you see jesus and he saw jesus and he took his breath I kneel down to pray he'd want me to live he'd want me to love each and every day till I see Jesus till I see Jesus and he takes my breath away I'm in no hurry to leave this world behind but I know I'll go to a better place 
And I'll see the heavens open. I'll see the Father's open arms. When you feel that kind of love, how could I stay? When I see Jesus, when I see Jesus, and he takes my breath away. So I'll keep breathing, and I'll keep breathing. If you've ever driven to a circus, you'll see the elephants standing out on the parking lot, right? The elephants will be out on the parking lot, these huge, powerful beasts. But they don't go anywhere. They don't run. They don't move. You know why? Because they got a chain around one of their legs. A little teeny chain with a little teeny peg in the ground that these beasts could rip out any old time they feel like it. Because they got the power. They got the power. All they got to do is jerk that leg and that little peg would come out of that and rip that concrete and tear that chain, but they don't budge. You know why? Because they were taught ever since they were a little baby elephant that when you feel this chain, you have no power. From the time they were born, when you feel this chain on your leg, that means you are nothing, you are nobody, and you don't move. Because you're not here to demonstrate your power, you're here to perform. And we got a lot of Christians who aren't here to demonstrate their power, they're here to perform. And so you come to church on Sunday and you perform, but you don't have any power. You come, you drag in church with this chain on your leg, this chain on your leg, talking about, I'm coming to worship God, and I'm coming, and he's able with this chain on your leg, and he's so high you can't get over with this chain on your leg, and, and he's so wide you can't get around, and you got this chain on your leg performing for the circus, and the hell is laughing at you eating its cotton candy with that chain on your leg. It's time for you to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get off of me. Let me go. Get that chain off of me. I'm free, and he who the Son sets free is free indeed. You're free. Walk like it. Act like it. Are you free? Are you free? Are you free? Did Jesus make you free? Then walk like it. Talk like it. Act like it. Hold your head up high and be free. He set you free. He set you free. All right, if you guys know anything about his ministry, you know that his uh, wife is suffering pretty bad right now. Lori, I think it's Lois is her name. Uh, I believe it's gallbladder cancer has come back, and he's stated at the beginning of the week uh, that they need a miracle. So, Father, would you glorify yourself in that family and in that ministry, Lord, that you would just make your name famous. Father, I ask you for peace and healing in that family. Amen. All right, well, we are coming to the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul has repeatedly been dealing with issues that uh, have caused division in this church. And this offer, this, uh, this issue today that we're going to read about, um, Paul could have rolled in and just threw a grenade down the center of that church and, and, and split it up. Uh, but he did not. He dealt with it with grace. And I pray, Lord, that you would enable me to have that same skill as we deal with uh, issues today that are like what Paul dealt with, Lord, that you would be with me. So when I was in second grade, my family uh, moved to Texas. My dad had gotten a job down there, and he actually had moved 
uh, before us. And I guess sometime while he was down there, he had either dropped something on his foot or stubbed his toe or, or something, because by the time we got there, um, his foot had healed enough that like a new big toenail had uh, kind of grown underneath the old one. And like any good parent, you bring all your kids together and you say, hey, look at this. <laughs> and the old nail he peeled off and there was this new disfigured looking thing underneath. And he said, you know, boy, if you sleep with your socks on, this will happen to you. I'm a 44-year-old man, and I know that medically and scientifically that is not true. I don't sleep with my socks on. <laughs> and you know, there are a lot of rules like that that our parents probably gave to us that they either didn't want you annoying them, annoying your siblings, or they were just trying to keep you safe, but they didn't necessarily um, find themselves established in the truth. Some examples that I think of uh, that were also told to me is if you keep making that face. Right? What's going to happen? It's going to stay like that. Or how about this one? Did anybody ever get told? If you eat, you have to wait a half an hour before you go swimming or, or an hour, an hour. Right? Also, completely bogus, untrue. But your parents did not tell you this rule to oppress you, they were trying to care for you, right? Um, how about going outside with wet hair, right? You'll catch a cold. Or uh, what happens if you touch a frog, right? Mom and dad just didn't want those nasty things in the house, right? It has nothing to do with warts. Or, or here's a funny one. Has anyone ever uh, gone to the public pool and you tell your little kid, you better not go to the bathroom in that pool because they put special dye in the water, and it's going to turn the water colors, and everybody's going to know what you did, right? Um, I remember being taught that if you ate the seeds of an apple, it would sprout uh, inside of you. And when I was in third grade, I had this elderly Jewish lady who had gone through, like, the Depression era. And she ate everything but the stem. And, man, that really messed me up. I'm like, lady. <laughs> you know what, though? We do this in the church as well. The church likes to look through and try to say, hey, you know, there is a, an element about this thing that is sinful, and I'm going to set up a boundary to that sin so that you don't get to the point where you actually commit that sin. And then what happens is it becomes tradition, and it gets taught that, hey, this thing in and of itself, this thing in and of itself is, is wrong. And you know, it's called adiaphora. We talked about this, uh, I guess, a month or so ago is the, the Greek word. It kind of came into uh, use pretty late in church history. 1538 was the first time it was written down. And what it means is these things are neither prohibited nor are they required by Scripture, but each individual has to make a decision about it based on their conscience. I don't want to do this because it's wrong for me. See if you relate to some of these examples that I have to try to make it clear. And I'm going to start with the less contentious probably today and work my way up to some more spicy and contentious ones. And I have one in particular in mind that I think does an excellent job capturing the spirit of this food that was offered to idols in Corinth. Who grew up in a church where they were taught you cannot have drums or instruments on stage, but only an organ? Anybody have that experience? And you probably were taught that from the pastor about, well, we don't find examples in the New Testament, and they go on and on, and they try to build a case, right, for it. Uh, we went to a church in New York where if you were a, a woman, you could not wear pants to church, and no one was allowed to wear blue jeans to church, right? That was like stamping your card right straight to hell if you wore blue jeans to church, right? Or, uh, or what kind of bathing suit are you allowed to wear, right? You better not be wearing no, you know, little thing or be showing your midsection or whatever, um, go to Europe. You'll be shocked. 
Or how about uh, attending R-rated movies, right? That's, a, that's, that's like the, the greatest sin that can be done is to go to uh, what was the one that just came out that uh, was promoting um, life, right? It was the, the story of the woman who had founded the Planned Parenthood and, and what converted her. They rated that R. There's a moral conflict for us Christians if we believe you can't go to an R-rated movie. At this point, I want to make clear, if you are living in your home with your parents and your parents say, you cannot do this, that is not what we are talking about. You must obey your parents. If you live under the authority of a government that says, hey, you have to be 17 to go to this movie and you go and you're 16, Romans chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 tells us that whoever resists authority is resisting God himself. You set your cruise control to 71 miles an hour in a 70 mile an hour zone. You are sinning against God himself, according to what Paul wrote. Anybody ever done that in a church van? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> how about uh, Yahtzee? Anybody ever play with dice? Or how about that friendly poker game? We're getting spicy now. Right? Oh, boy. How about getting a tattoo or having a piercing that isn't, you know, just an earring for a lady? Better not be on a guy. Right? I bet you there's lots of folks here that start a little angry at old brother Andy up here. Like, you can't be saying that from the pulpit. I know the Bible says that's not true. Well, the example that I have in mind is even spicier than that. And I want to give you six reasons why I think this is a good example of adiaphora that really captures the heart of this eating meat that was offered to idol. First of all, my example, just like this one in Corinth, has only been a restriction or a prohibition that was understood by the people in recent history. Paul founded the church in Corinth in 50 A.D. He wrote this letter to the 1 Corinthians at the end of 56 A.D., maybe the beginning of 57, we're not really sure. So for about six years in the history of Corinth, this eating meat offered to idols was a prohibited activity. And you know what? The second reason is that they prohibited it. It was because that meat offered to idols was a serious social evil in Corinth. Corinth had this temple to... Uh, Aphrodite, they had a thousand temple prostitutes working up there. The violation of purity in the marriage was rampant. And for a lot of folks who had gone to worship and, and, and they go and they eat this meat, they get immediately brought back in their mind to this time of their life when they were so carnal and so wicked that was destroying their society. And so the response was to a specific social evil. But it was only really in Corinth that this specific thing applied. So the example I'm going to give you today is something that really only we in the United States really even blink an eye at or think anything of it. You go to anywhere else, Korea, Vietnam, South America, Africa, North Africa, Israel, Christian nations in Europe. They don't care. But we in America, we have a very recent historical anger in response to a social evil that we say this thing must be wrong. Fourth, we put our attention on the object that's prohibited instead of the intent of the wicked heart of those who abuse this thing. Just like in Corinth, they said, is the meat wrong? Paul said it has nothing to do with the meat, we'll see. It's the intent that goes in. Fifth, there was very heated disagreement about this. Think about this. These people had had pastors and elders in their churches for almost seven years. And they could not resolve this issue. And they had to write a letter to an apostle to get the official word of God on this because they didn't want to believe those who were put in charge over them by God himself and by Paul through his leadership as an apostle. They had to write this letter. This was divisive, and it was important. Sixth and finally, the lines of division 
that were drawn on the issue were not drawn based on scriptural theological concerns. They were drawn from concerns about pastoral care. They really wanted to take care of their people. They didn't want to be oppressive. They wanted to be loving to people. And some people saw that as being wicked and, and, and prohibiting what God does not prohibit. And they said, you know what? I am free. But see, they acted like that elephant who was free that was just going to go trample over everybody in the parking lot instead of using their freedom responsibly. So the lines of division were based on pastoral care. So what is this so-called sin, this adiaphora that I'm going to hopefully not roll a grenade down the center of this aisle? Drinking alcohol in moderation. Anybody's ears burning yet? Like, I can't believe he just said that out loud up here that I could, I could have a beer with a football game with friends. The way you feel, and I'm not telling you that you should. If your conscience says that's wrong, obey your conscience. God has given a grace to you. Don't deny his grace. Just like those who did not want to eat that meat that was offered to idols that we're going to see was a grace to them. But Paul makes a distinction. You know, when I got up this morning, I thought about wearing that shirt that matches this carpet because I knew what I was going to be using for that illustration today. So just in case. So I'm not going to build a theological case about this, whether this is right or wrong. We can talk about it. You can do your research. You can come talk to me. But when I was preparing for this sermon, I did come across a particular individual many of you may know, Martin Luther. Anybody heard of him? Are you familiar with how he grew up and the amount of concern and anger and anguish and pain he felt over his sin? He would go and confess so long the person he was confessing to told him, stop coming to me until you have actually sinned. He would lie out in his monastery on the stone floor in the winter and almost freeze himself to death as penance for having a single idle thought. When he went to Rome as a monk, he climbed the steps on uh, the, vet, the, the ladder in church on his knees saying this prayer that Catholics do all the way up thinking that this activity, this thing I'm doing is going to pay for my sins. His knees were bloody. This Martin Luther, after he had learned the meaning and freedom in the gospel, was staying at a castle called Vest Coburg from mid-April to early October in 1530, and he wrote this letter to spite the devil. Be strong and cheerful and cast out those monstrous thoughts. Whenever the devil harasses you, thus seek the company of men or drink more or joke and talk nonsense or do some other merry thing. Sometimes we must drink more, sport, recreate ourselves, I and even sin a little to spite the devil, so that we leave him no place for troubling our consciences with trifles. We are conquered if we try too conscientiously not to sin at all. So when the devil says to you, do not drink, answer him, I will drink and write freely, just because you tell me not to, one must always do what Satan forbids. What other cause do you think that I have for drinking so much strong drink? talking so freely and making merry so often, except that I wish to mock and harass the devil who is wont to map and harass me. Would that I could contrive some great sin to spite the devil, that he might understand that I would not even then acknowledge it, and that I was conscious of no sin whatever. We whom the devil thus seeks to annoy should remove the whole Decalogue, that's the Ten Commandments, from our hearts and minds. Now, let me be clear as your pastor, I am not endorsing that you take the advice of Luther. That's not what I'm saying. I'm telling you that because you can see the opinion he has about the greaterness of freedom in the gospel compared to sin. And Martin Luther was known to go to excess to make his point. I believe there's somebody in government right now who we might relate to that does something very similar. So let's get a little perspective about how this uh, freedom is. And we begin by reading in chapter 8, verse 1. 
that we're going to find up verses 1 through 3, that it is love which is greater than knowledge. Paul said, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So Paul says, yes, you do have knowledge, but if you had knowledge like knowledge of God, you would know that your love for your brother is more important than the freedom that you have by your head knowledge. He said, what you need to know is who God is, not what you can and cannot do. He said, this knowledge that you have, this trying to be all sanctimonious and proper, all that does is puff you up and make you think that your righteousness is going to give you a place before God. But if you knew God, you would know God says that you are loving. If anyone loves, is verse 3, he is known by God. So what? So what? Verses 4 through 6, we find, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. Now, later in chapter 10 of this same book, Paul is going to confirm that when they are worshiping idols, they are, in fact, communing with evil, devilish spirits. Paul here, although it seems like he's saying they're, they're, they are not real, he's, he's making this case compared to the glory of God, the person of God, this created thing, this idol, that's nothing at all. Doesn't matter, he says. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is only one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So Paul is going to take sides here about whether something is right or wrong but he's going to qualify it based on that first statement that love is greater than knowledge. And why does he take that side? Why does he say that it doesn't matter that this food was offered to the idol? Because the truth of the food is based in the character and nature of who God is. No mere spirit or devilish thing can change what God has declared to be true. He made that food to be nourishing to people's bodies. And some idiot person offering it to an idol does not take away the goodness God intended. And he says, that's just knowledge. That's just based on the truth of who God is. That's our second principle we're looking at. It's God who gets to determine the truth. It's not our feelings. It's not our social convictions. It's not even our governments and leaders when they're opposing what God said is right or good. And Paul is going to continue on and he's going to make this airtight case that this meat is no less helpful to the body or any more harmful in its plain factual existence because of what somebody has done. But that doesn't change the fact that that head knowledge of the strong Christian is not the same knowledge as is possessed in the heart of those he calls the weak Christian. And he uses strong and weak in Romans chapter 14 and briefly, the definition of that is not how long you've believed or how much you believe. It changes based on where your heart has correlated to your study and your mind. He calls the weak Christian the one whose faith is supported by the things that they have in their life, these crutches of what they can and cannot do. And they go and do things that help them stay in communion with the Lord. Paul says... Um, for him, all things are legal, but not all things are helpful, right? Because he knows there's really only one God. He doesn't need those crutches. As far as Paul was concerned, this eating meat to idols or not eating meat to idols was essentially the same as if you like white bread or wheat bread. Uh, do you like pineapple on your pizza or not like pineapple on your pizza, right? Paul doesn't care. He says it's just meat. God made the meat. God also made the idol. Originally, good and then it fell 
which is interesting. And God did not redeem those that fell who were angels. So Paul continues, verse 7. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat, fo eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But he doesn't let the strong Christian off the hook just because it's true that that food is not really tainted. He says, food will not condemn, commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat. You know, that's really true. These things we like to count as our Christian freedom. If we just didn't exercise those, would we really be worse off as people? No. Sure wouldn't. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, the strong, eating in an idol's temple, will he, the weak, not be encouraged? If his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols, and so by your knowledge this weak person is destroying the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. I read in an essay one time that a good way to summarize this passage is with the acronym JOY, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. So let me make two final observations about this. The first is that Paul talks about what does it mean to be a stumbling block in verse 8. He says, but do not take, I'm sorry, verse 9, but take care that this right of yours does not stumble or somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And then what does that mean in verse 11? He says, so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. So he says it encourages them to do it, and then he says they become destroyed. Paul is not saying they're mad at you because of your freedom, or they're offended because of you, because of what you're doing, and they feel like maybe you're giving a bad reputation to their church. Whose church is it? Amen. Amen. So it's not offending or displeasing another Christian, but rather it is encouraging that weaker brother to sin. Here in verse 13, he says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. That word stumble is what we get our English word scandal from, scandalize. Properly, what it means is uh, you've all seen the little cartoon trap of the box with the stick on it and there's a little carrot or something in there, and there's somebody standing back with a string on the stick, and when you go in for the carrot, they pop the stick out, and the box falls, and you're trapped. That scandalo is the stick. He says, your freedom exercised wrongly without love for your brother is that stick that traps them in sin. See, Paul says that if you get to the point where you are trying to exercise your freedom because you love that more than your brother and you encourage, incite, uh, instigate, in any way motivate that person to violate their conscience and go into sin, which for them it is sin, you have become a scandal. And Paul, being an apostle who was not in Corinth, said this is so important of a concept because I am so esteemed in my position that even in wherever I am writing this thing, I would never eat meat again. He's not even in Corinth. He's not weak with the weaker brother. He just said, if it's that important, if that weak brother cannot get over their conscience, I'll give up eating meat forever. So I'd like to ask the praise team to come back up as we close, and I'm going to read up Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Because you know what? We are not saved 
from the wrath of God by not sinning. You are not saved by the wrath of God because you have not sinned or you continue to not sin. Rather, you are saved from sinning by God's grace. So if you're going to look at what do I do, how do I act, how do I behave, and all you ever look at is what does it mean to sin, that's what you're going to do. When I was learning to ride a motorcycle, one of the things they taught us that uh, if you constantly focus on that pothole, that's where the bike is going to go, and you're going to fall right down into it. And that's what many of us like to do when we think that we're religious people, right? We focus on the sin, 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 and what we should be looking at is Christ, Christ, Christ. And what did Christ do? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not to his own interest, but also to the interests of the other. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So I ask you, do you value your freedom more than your brother in Christ? Or do you want to be like Jesus who said, you know what? I measure the universe in the span of my hand. When I created the universe, the angels celebrated in joy. The stars, every star in the universe is a mere dim reflection of the glory that God has. And God said, I love you so much that I'm going to take all of that and give all of that away to come down and set you free. So who are you to then put your chains of conscience on somebody else? Because the one who the Lord set free is free indeed. The weak do not get to shackle the strong because Christ set them free. And at the same time, Paul says, this God who came down out of love is the one you're supposed to imitate. So who are you the strong to trample that weak person with your freedom and to use it and bully them and share with them things that they do not get to do because they have not been set free in their conscience of that. And that's a gift of God for them. How many of you, like me, have done this to your brother or sister, have said, I think this is wrong, you don't get to do that? How many of you have said, your activity, even though it's not prohibited explicitly in the Bible or, or promoted, maybe they're not tithing the 10% that you think you're supposed to tithe. And you say, I believe that's true and I know you're not doing it. And so you're sinning because my conscience says so. Or how many of you have been told what you're doing makes me want to go fall into that sin? Will you share your Christian love for me by giving that up? And you won't. And you say, I value my freedom more than I value loving my brother. I'd like for the deacons to come up and Brother Billy. If anybody identifies with that, if anybody has had that experience, if anybody has said, you know what, even in a little way, I have done that, would you come up and pray with us? Ask God for forgiveness. Ask God to heal us, to take this division that existed in Corinth and exists in every church in America today. Would you say, Lord, I don't want to have that division between myself and my brother because you died for everyone here who is in Christ.
maybe this message is hard to hear because you're still holding on to what you believe and you know in your heart is right. And you say, boy, that pastor, he's a glutton and a drunk. You know, you look in Luke's gospel, he said, the Pharisee said that exact thing about Jesus Christ himself. He said, John the Baptist, you came, you said he came fasting and not drinking wine, but when I came, you said, I'm a glutton and a drunk. How many of you have looked at your brother and said, boy, you're just living your life way out of control? That person is speaking and preaching the truth and the, the gospel and the kingdom of Christ and freedom and life and enjoying what they have, what God has blessed them with. And boy, we just get so mad about that. Or maybe you won't stop in what you're doing and say, Lord, I know that what I'm doing, I'm free to do, but this brother or sister of mine, they're just weak. In their heart, they don't know yet that they're free of that sin, that they're free to, to enjoy your creation. And so, Lord, what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent you in my life. I'm going to share the love you showed for this creation by giving up your glory. Father, I'm going to come alongside my weaker brother, my weaker sister, and we're going to walk through this life together, and we're going to be united, not divided. We're not going to yell at each other. We're not going to be angry at each other. But Lord, we're going to come together in love. We're going to express your truth, Father, your love. We're going to give up our selfishness, and we're going to humble ourselves to you. Spirit of loneliness, there is freedom. When Spirit of loneliness, there is freedom. Come and lift your eyes. Yes, 
Jesus reigns in this place. Jesus reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace falling on every face. There is freedom. Later in that same letter, Paul wrote, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. As you walk out today, follow Paul's advice. Think on these things.